I continue to be really glad, to be uh, very pleased that we're doing a series on addiction and recovery. As I hear stories and things going on in the life of our congregation, I'm reminded of how important this is. As I hear stories and things taking place in our community, I continue to think, God, you led us in exactly this way. In part, because we need to wrestle and think a little bit about addiction and recovery. Um, and because I think that this series has and, and will take us in areas that we might not ordinarily think about or wrestle with. And we're going to do that in one of those themes this morning. We're going to talk about shame. About shame. The book that uh, we've been using as a resource for the series, I hope you've had a chance to grab a copy. There's still some in the back. If you're following along, this, this week we're talking about chapter 5. And the title of that chapter is Ending the Shame. Ending the shame. We're going to wrestle with that a little bit. And, and I think that shame comes sometimes as we misunderstand and, and do not have the relationship that we're meant to have with God. And so we think maybe there's shame there. And sometimes that shame comes in our interpersonal relationships and how we relate, relate to each other and, and sometimes cause shame in those relationships as well. I want to wrestle with that first one this morning, and I want to read you a story that, that the recovery-minded church pointed to, and, and I want to read it where I first read it in a wonderful book by Philip Yancey called What's So Amazing About Grace. Philip Yancey shares this story, and I have to tell you, it is a hard story to hear, both the details of it and the implications of it. This is from Philip Yancey. He says, I told a story in my book, The Jesus I Never Knew, a true story that long afterward continued to haunt me. I heard it from a friend who works with a down and out in Chicago. And then he quotes his friend. A prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told me she had been renting out her daughter, two years old, to men interested in kinky sex. She made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could earn, earn on her own in a night. She had to do it, she said, to support her own drug habit. I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable. I'm re required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman. At last, I asked if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. What struck me about my friend's story is that women, much like this prostitute, fled toward Jesus not away from him. The worse a person felt about herself, the more likely she saw Jesus as a refuge. Has the church lost that gift? Evidently, the down and out who flocked to Jesus when he lived on earth no longer feel welcome among his followers. What has happened? As I say, those, those words are hard to hear and the implications of them that the church has, has become a place where folks don't look for, for healing but expect condemnation. I want to wrestle with this topic of how to end the shame. How to end the shame. 
And one of the things I think is a, is a piece of that is the willingness to share. I mean, a lot of times we kind of pretty ourselves up in church and make it seem like everything's going great in, in our lives. And, and it's just not the truth. It's not the truth out there in the world, and it's not the truth in our lives. And when we hide from that, when we're willing to be honest with that, however, when we're willing to be transparent about what we've gone through and, and where we are, it helps others to share the same. I'm just so pleased and, and um, honored by the, the sharing that has taken place already. Don's testimony two weeks back, Frank's last week, what Justin had planned to share if he wasn't stuck on the side of 95 this morning, and next week, uh, Sean and then Stephanie reminds us of, of the brokenness that's in all of us when we're willing to share that. As I've thought about that, I, I read in the book and I've been thinking and wrestling that as your pastor, I ought to be willing to share, to lead us in, in that. So I wanted to tell you about a time when, when I felt shame. When my wife, Carolyn, and I were dating, I did something that deeply hurt her. She has asked me not to share the details of that. It's maybe enough to say that it could have easily ended our relationship. And I think about the wonderful 26 years of marriage that we have, the two beautiful boys that we have, and I, I almost ruined that. My wife is a very forgiving person, and we worked through it, we dealt with it, and it was gone. But I couldn't let go of it. They make the observation in, um, in recovery-minded church, and counselors and therapists have said this for years, uh, that there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is when you say, I did something bad. Shame is when you say, I am bad. Guilt is when you say, I made a mistake. Shame is when you feel like you are a mistake. And that started working on me. I felt shame. And that went on for a couple of years. Then I was working with a, a friend, a, a spiritual guide, and I felt open enough to share. And... After I was done, she said, do you truly believe that God forgives you? That you believe that, that what we say, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, that in God's heart that is gone. And I said, yes, I, I trust that. I believe that. I just can't forgive myself. And she said, Oh, so you think you're better than God. I was like, whoa, 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 where did that come from? I, I didn't say that. She said, well, if God can forgive you, but you can't forgive yourself, then you must think you're better than God. And it was like it was washed away. When she said that, I went, yes, if God can forgive me, and Carolyn can, then I can do that as well. But see, that only happens when we're willing to share, to be transparent about where we've been, what we've done, it's only then that the healing can take place. Which is maybe the next piece of that, that when you are willing to share, then you have the opportunity to have someone else support and strengthen and help guide you along the way. Had I not shared, she would not have been able to help release that shame that I was feeling. If Mr. Justin Taylor had shared this morning, um, you would have been touched by what he shared. And one of the things I know we planned to share was, was that we, he and I have been meeting for the last number of months. And I know he's appreciative of that. And I wanted him to know, and I'll let him know when I see him, that I'm proud of him. I, I see God changing and transforming Justin into 
who God wants him to be. I, I see that, that God is helping him become a new person. And so it's been my honor to, to meet with him and talk and help him along that journey. And we all need folks that we can share with and to help strengthen us along the way. Sometimes that's uh, spouses and family. Sometimes that's a, a faith friend, sometimes referred to. Or some people call them a, an accountability person, somebody who helps them to not do the things that they don't want to do and do the things they want. Somebody in our lives to guide us. Some uh, growth groups are like that. I worry some of our growth groups are maybe more oriented toward learning and not supporting, but they, they should do both. We need to have other people in our lives to help us along the way. We need each other, as I, as I talked about last week, to help end shame. And we need an experience of God. We need to know how truly God loves us. That that impacts us. In fact, I, I want to I share a little bit and wrestle with this morning, particularly in our passage from the Gospel of John. Uh, Two weeks back, I was on silent retreat, and a couple of folks have said, well, what is a silent retreat? And I, I'd never been on a retreat like this. I was up in an old Jesuit training center up in Wernersville, Pennsylvania, and I met with my spiritual director who I've worked with for many years, but you wouldn't need to have one. Uh, there were a couple other folks she didn't know who were assigned to her, and all she did was assign me some prayer exercises each morning, I would do those exercises 20, 30, sometimes 40 minutes. I would journal about that afterwards. Then I would go the next morning and uh, share my journal with, with my spiritual director. We would talk about that, and then she would give me three more exercises. And that's what I did every day of the week. And it helped me to get deeper into Scripture than, than I, I often do. And I want to share a little bit of that with you this morning. Um, particularly in the passage from John chapter 8. I want to help us get deeper into this particular passage. And if it's meaningful to you, you may want to look up, open your Bible this week, and spend a little more time, more deeply than we have time to do this morning, in the same way in John chapter 8. So let me read and, and share this particular story with you. So we hear, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, then early in the morning he came to the temple. The temple is this beautiful white building in the center of Jerusalem. It is the center of the Jewish faith, and even in the time of Jesus, it had probably been there 2,000 years. All the people came to Jesus, and he sat down and began to teach them. Picture him there on the steps of the temple and people gathered to hear him teach. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were the, the powerful, the religious leaders of Jesus' day and they were, they were terribly dedicated to the laws, the Jewish laws. They brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Now the Jewish law actually says to bring both the man and the woman if they were caught together as it seems they were. For some reason they only bring the woman, maybe a reflection on the patriarchal society then and, and even now we experience, and making her stand before them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. I want you to pause for a minute. If it's helpful, close your eyes even. And picture yourself in the place of that woman. Put yourself in the pages of Scripture. Imagine yourself standing there. Perhaps not her particular sin, but you. Each of us caught in whatever sin it is that's taken place in our lives. We're caught in it, standing there before the religious leaders with a look of, of anger and, and uh, hate on 
their faces, the crowd uh, staring at us. Whatever our sin is laid bare there as well before Jesus. Maybe things that we've done in the past that we are guilty of that maybe we feel shame for or maybe even things that are still taking place in our lives. Put yourself in the story and imagine yourself there standing in that place. What does that feel like for any of us? They said, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Maybe our own crimes are not worthy of being put to death as evidently this one was. But our, our crime, our sin is, is still open there. It causes guilt and shame in us. And then they asked Jesus, now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. They wanted to put Jesus in a no-win situation. If he says, well, well, let her go, then he is breaking the Jewish law, and, and that's not appropriate. She's done something wrong. But if he says, obey the law, she will be put to death. They put Jesus in a no-win situation. And so what does he do to the woman? What does he do to us? Jesus bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. We do not know what he wrote there on the ground. Folks have wondered. Some have suggested that perhaps he was writing the words of Scripture. Maybe a Scripture passage reminding us of the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. He continues to do so. Maybe you can picture him there in the dust. And then they kept on questioning him. He straightened up and he said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. I want you to change positions now. Now we're not the one brought in accusation in front of the Pharisees, the scribes, the crowds, and Jesus. Now we are in the crowds ourselves. We are the ones that sometimes think we're doing better than others and and accuse and look down on others. And Jesus says to us, if you haven't done anything wrong, if you're perfect, if you don't have any sin at all, then sure, you can be the first one to throw a stone. And we think about what we've done in our own lives. And once again, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground. Again, we do not know what he is writing there in the dust. Some have suggested maybe he was writing names, for he knew the name of everyone in that crowd. Maybe he was writing out sins in the dust. Greed and pride and lust and jealousy, and all of the things that exist in any of us and existed in that crowd. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. Each and every one of them, each and every one of us, know that we are just as broken And maybe it's the oldest, the wisest, the ones who are most aware of the mistakes and the the, the difficulties and the sins that, that have piled up over a lifetime. It was the oldest who left first. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. Or picture being left alone yourself there standing with Jesus. Can you see Jesus? Can you see the look of love and forgiveness on his face for each and every one of us? Jesus straightened up 
And he said to her, woman? Or maybe he says, our names? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said to her and says to us, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. The one as the Son of God who could, for he had no sin, could, says neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And Jesus ends the shame for her and for us. And the healing and recovery begins.